This morning, I want to start out, we have two texts that I want, to, I, want to, um, I want to start with this morning. Psalm chapter 2, verse 11 says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And Psalm 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Father, we pray, God, as we look to your word this morning, Lord, that you would, um, Lord, shine your light, Lord, onto our lives. God, help us to understand you and to see you more clearly, Father, that, that our faith and our trust in you might be expanded and might become more strong. In Jesus' name, all this people said? Amen. Amen. There's a movie I can't recommend, but it came out when I was in high school called A Bronx Tale. It's kind of one of the mob movies. And in it, it tells a story of a, a young guy, I think his name is Cologio, they, they call him C, and he begins to, um, to be attracted to this mob boss. And, and it's kind of the story of, of their relationship and his relationship with his father. It's whatever. It's, a, it's kind of a, you know, it's an R-rated movie. So um, uh, think about that. But there's a, there's a line in it that's pretty well known. C asks the mob boss, Sonny, he says, is it better to be loved or to be feared? right? And you know, he's a mob boss, right? So he says it's better to be feared. But that question is actually a pretty common question that people have. Is it better to be loved or feared? If you're familiar with The Office, at one point, Michael Scott asked the question, be better to love or feared? And he said, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Um, <laughs> but we tend to think about love and fear as being sort of opposite ends of the spectrum, right? They're, they're not related. And yet, when we look to the Bible, the Bible encourages us to both love God and to fear God. In fact, the Bible says over 300 times in the Bible, we're told to fear God. The word fear is the word yare in, in Hebrew, and it, it means uh, primarily to be fear, afraid, stand in awe, reverence, honor, respect, dread, dreadful, uh, to cause astonishment and awe, to be held in awe. That, that these two kind of um, tensions are in the Bible to love God and to fear God. And so when we read like we did in Psalm 211, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Sometimes we struggle to understand that. How do you rejoice with trembling? Or how do you fear the Lord? Um, you know, in, in modern religion, modern Christianity, we tend to overemphasize sometimes or emphasize God's gentleness, his mercy, his loving kindness, his friendship, his nearness. We talk, to, we talk about coming to God just as you are. We, we, we um, have carefully curated photos of us with our Bible and a latte sitting on a blanket at the beach, you know, and kind of talk about, yeah, you know, uh, just spending some time with the Lord or, or enjoying his presence. And, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the fact that we, we tend to emphasize um, or, or think about God with a level of familiarity and comfortability. But I do want to say that, that we are in danger if, we, if it's not also tied with a, an appropriate awe or fear of the Lord, we're actually in danger of having a deadly misunderstanding of who God is. Because while he is near and he does invite us to draw near to him, he also is, as, as um, uh, Nehemiah says, he's a great and terrible God. He is is so immense, he is so holy, he is so strong, it's, it's difficult for our minds to comprehend. And so sometimes we struggle with the idea of fearing God because God is supposed to be loving and gentle and kind and good, why should we fear him? But I wanna give you an example um, from the Bible of Ex in Exodus chapter 19. Now, this example is just one of many, many, many examples that I could have chosen. It's the story of the people being led out of Egypt. They've actually been, at, they, they crossed over the Red Sea three months ago. They've been in the wilderness and now they've come to rest at the base of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the mountain where, where Moses had uh, first encountered God in the burning bush. And God is going to renew his covenant with the people, with the nation of Israel. And in, in chapter 20, you know that God is going to give Moses the Ten Commandments. And it's this whole process, but here's the setup for it. In the very beginning, in verse 10, it says, The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them. Say consecrate them. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down to Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. 
So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain, a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. I just wish one of those Israelites could see our Instagram pictures of us sitting on a blanket at the beach with our Bibles open and a little latte, right? That's not the picture the Bible's painting here at all. The Bible is painting a picture here of a God whose, whose, whose holiness is being compared with our holiness. It says, don't even approach the mountain. It says, set a boundary around it. Consecrate the people. Make them wash their clothes. Make themselves set apart for three days for the purpose of approaching God. And if anyone violates these boundaries, they're to be put to death. In fact, they're so, they're so profane that you shouldn't even touch them. You got to throw a rock at them or shoot them through with an arrow so that you kill them so nobody even touches them. Any person or any animal. It's a dramatic scene that oftentimes our modern minds can seem harsh, and yet this is the God that the Bible reveals. A God who sets boundaries. And it takes those boundaries very serious. You know, today, we want to kind of have a, a, a God where we set the boundaries. And we think, God, I, I think you should act like this, or I think you should do this. The problem is, is that our faith is directly related to the size of our God. What I mean is, A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, what comes to your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. The most important thing about you is is when you conceptualize God, who is he? Who in your mind is God? The reason is really important because are you worshiping the true God or are you not? And the problem is is that many people unconsciously want to shrink God to a God that they understand, that fits comfortably within the box that they can control. They create a God that makes sense to them a God that thinks how they think and a God who acts how they act. You know, when they read the scriptures, they skip over the parts that don't fit with that God. They make excuses and apologize for the ways that it seems like maybe God is, 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 um, is, is large or is harsh or is difficult. And they just, they make excuses for it or they ignore it completely. They look for churches where, where the pastor preaches sermons that make them feel good and make them feel comfortable staying exactly where they're at, where they're, they're not required to give any kind of deep commitment. The problem, though, is you're going to have a hard time walking out a real faith when you're worshiping that God, because the reason is, is, God is that God is not hearing your prayers. The reason that God is not hearing your prayers is because that God does not exist. You might as well be talking to yourself. God has called us to worship him as he is, as he has revealed himself to us. The God that you invent quickly becomes unnecessary. Church and religion just become a place to network or have a community for your family or something like that. But there's no life, there's no help, there's no truth. And when you encounter questions, the deep questions of life about meaning and significance and my purpose, why am I here? When you go through difficult times and you're struggling and, and, and you're, you're maybe dealing with loneliness or rejection or fear or you're coming to the end of yourself or you're sinned against or your sin is, is being found out, you have no God really to turn to because the God is just a fictitious imagining of yourself, a God that cannot help you. That's not the God of the Bible, though. The God of the Bible is awesome in his power, is awesome in his size, is awesome in his greatness. Look what the Bible says about who God is. Colossians chapter one, starting verse 13, it says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, 
Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The God who lives, the real God, the God of the Bible, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is able to rescue you because he is so great. Because he has come to have first place in everything. Because, because he created everything and nothing was, apart, was created apart from him. And in him, all things are sustained. All things find their purpose. Because he's the powerful, the great and living God. You know, as we observe the created universe, we begin to get a better understanding of who God is. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, through creation, so that they are without excuse. In theological terms, we have natural revelation and divine revelation. Divine revelation is the word of God, God's word spoken through prophets and apostles for us. Natural revelation is the revelation you can get about who God is just by observing the natural universe. And this goes for all people in all cultures of all times. They could just wake up and they could look at the world that God created. They could look at themselves, their own bodies. They could look at the world around them and they can discern things about God, his invisible attributes, his divine nature. The Bible says they are easily understood by observing God's natural revelation, his creation. Therefore, no one is, everyone is without excuse. And it's true, as we look out at the universe, we see, man, God is remarkable. He's astonishing. His creation is, is amazing. You know, but if, it's, if it was true 2,000 years ago that you could just look at the universe and look at the world that God created and understand God, how much more true is that for us today in modern times? You know, a lot of people tend to think, or, or we've been kind of conditioned to think, that somehow science has taken away our need for God. That is laughable. It's actually quite the opposite. I like what Pastor Mark said. He said this, he said this for years, but it's made a significant impact on me. He said, you know, the, the more technologically advanced we get, the, the, the better microscopes we can get, we can look closer and closer at things. We don't find out that the world is simpler and simpler. We find out that the world is vastly more complex than we ever could have imagined. And, and as we technologically become more advanced and we, we build bigger telescopes and we look out further, we don't find that the universe is, is small and understandable. We find out that it's mind-blowingly vast and far more complex than we ever could have possibly imagined. Every year, astrophysicists are telling us that there, is, there are new stars and new galaxies by the billions that they're discovering. Space is way bigger than Copernicus ever could have imagined. It's unbelievable. As we look at the world, um, it, we find out that, that things like when, when Darwin wrote his, uh, when, he, when he published um, um, Origin of the Species, and he, he came up with his first idea of Darwinian evolution. And, and, and um, at that time, it was, it was 1859, we didn't understand, we didn't know DNA existed. Cells had been discovered, but he thought that cells were real simplistic um, uh, little globs, little masses. Well, in, in the intervening years, we've come to find out that cells are incredibly complex. Uh, David Berlinski, the, the, the noted uh, philosopher and astronomer, he said cells have a, are like a galaxy all within themselves. There are so many functions and things operating in the, in the 30 trillion cells that make up every single one of us. The Darwinian evolution, neo-Darwinian evolution is, is simply unable to describe how those would come into being. It's why it is beginning to fall out of favor, not just among, obviously, Christian scientists, but among regular scientists. The more we learn, the closer we look, the more we understand about the genetic code that's embedded in our DNA. It reveals someone that is vastly intelligent vastly complex, shockingly so. I want to give you just a couple images that maybe help understand a little bit what I'm talking about. These are, these are images that are zoomed in um, uh, under a microscope. So let's go ahead and look at that first one. This is a, an agate. It's a, it's a kind of stone that's formed by um, ocean sediment. This, this particular agate is found in uh, the Teepee Canyon in South Dakota. I don't know if you've ever been to the ocean in South Dakota, 
but it's beautiful, okay? I mean, just things that make you go, oh, interesting. But if you look at it, you think, man, what remarkable, beautiful, intricate design went into forming this rock that are just scattered all over the ground? Let's go ahead and look at the next picture. This picture is a picture of brain cells under a microscope. Th those brain cells are, are creating neural pathways that create our memories. That when you think back to your childhood, it's because of what happened inside of these brain cells to create neural pathways. How crazy is that? That's wild that it's stored in that. You think, man, God created this and stored this in these, in these cells. What a remarkable, intelligent God. Go ahead and look at the next one. Anybody know what this is? It's a butterfly mouth. How scary is that? <laughs> these butterflies have these mouths that when they go and they pollinate plants, they can reach down to the, the bottom of flowers and stuff, right? So that thing un, unfurls. That's terrifying. <laughs> go ahead and look at that next one. This is the foot of a diving beetle. The foot of a diving beetle. You know, there are over 350,000 known species of beetle in the world. This is the foot of just one of those species. Look at all the intricate design that has gone in to creating that foot to allow it to walk on water. Go ahead and put the next one. This is a drop of coffee. How many of you guys are grateful for this one? That's the... That's a, a zoomed-in picture of the flavor crystals that are in coffee that made your coffee this morning taste the way that it did. God gave us receptors in our mouth to be able to taste and, and, and in our body to be able to receive the caffeine that's keeping us awake right now. Go ahead and see the next one. This is a single-celled protist, okay? It's not a plant, animal, or a fungus. Algae is, is a protist, okay? They're almost all single-celled organisms, but look at all the things that are going on inside of that cell that God put there. It's remarkable. It's astonishing how powerful he is. Let's look at the next one. That's a butterfly wing scale, a single scale on a butterfly wing. And finally, this last one is retina cells from the, from the eye of a mouse. Okay, all of those retina cells receiving light and sending images that this human being is trying to kill me are going through that retina cell into the brain being translated. God is remarkable. You see, the, the, the more we understand, the deeper we go with him, it doesn't become less complex, it becomes more complex. There's a whole universe going on that we're completely unaware of that we cannot see with the naked eye. And yet through modern technology, we find out, oh my gosh, this is a remarkable God. But it's not just true with what, you, with what you look at when you go smaller. It's true with what you look at when you go larger. You think about the immenseness of the universe. I want to show you a quick video. The video is going to start on planet Earth, okay? And it's going to try to give us a scale for the things in the universe. It's going to go from Earth to some of the other planets that, that we know about. And then it's going to go into some stars, and then it's going to go into some black holes, and it's going to give you the diameter of these things, okay? It's going to go from kilometers, it's going to go to light years, okay? It's going to, it's going to uh, uh, pull off, and it's going to get, um, I think the last one before the universe is Boots Void, which is the largest structure we know about in the universe. And I want you just to get something of a perspective on the scale of God's created universe, okay? So let's go ahead and run that. 13,000 kilometers diameter. Uranus. Nice try. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, 140,000 kilometers in diameter.
Proxima Centauri, obviously not our sun. There's our sun. You can barely see the earth now. Our sun is comparatively a small sun. A small star. Arcturus, 36 million kilometers in diameter. You can't see our sun anymore. Regal is 97 million kilometers in diameter. Betelgeuse and Canis Majoris. That's what it's called, Betelgeuse. Canis Majoris, two billion kilometers in diameter. Scooty is the largest star that we know about. NGC 1277 is a black hole. Four hundred billion kilometers across is is ton 618. Here's the Cat's Eye Nebula, a small galaxy. We're no longer able to use kilometers, we have to use light years now. Next one should be the Milky Way galaxy, or the small Magellan cloud, 7,000 light years across. The Milky Way galaxy, 100,000 light years across. Traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to go from one end to the other. 250 million light years is Boots Void. And there's the scope of the known universe as far as we can tell. 130 billion light years across. Okay. The Bible says that God spoke and the stars came into existence. As we, as we meditate and think about the God, the creator of the universe, it should give us an awe and wonder at how powerful and amazing he is. Oftentimes, atheists will claim something like religion makes people, or belief in God makes people uncurious. They just say God did it, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. For one, just set aside the fact that, that so many of the, of the scientists who laid the foundation for modern science, uh, Newton, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Descartes, uh, Robert Boyle, Pascal, all of these guys were all believers in God. Set that aside, for the Christian, science is significantly more meaningful because it reveals who God is. It reveals his nature. It's not just something that just happened or just occurred, but it reveals the mind and the character. The Bible says, it says in, in Romans 1, the invisible attributes, the eternal power, the divine nature of who God is. From science and observation of the natural world, we find that God is ordered and he's logical. We, there, there's, there's laws that govern the universe. There's not just, not just physical laws that show that God is consistent and that he's faithful, but there's, there's uh, laws, logical laws of mathematics that you find everywhere that you go, that you can trust God, that he's consistent, that he's wise, that he's astonishingly powerful, that he's intricate and he's vast and complex. We find that God is, is in, in, in an artist who's incredibly aesthetic. He has, he has a, an incredible eye for beauty and design. We find that he's good, that he makes the sun rise and the rain fall. For all the people who want to say, you know, uh, why, does, why do bad things happen? Why do so many good things happen? The universe is so full of God's kindness and his love towards us. He is vastly superior in an intellect and understanding than we are. 
The idea that you would ever sit back and say, well, I don't know about that God or, or anything like that is such a, a foolish, in the scope of, of his mind and his greatness and his power, it is so foolish for us to contend with God, for us to align ourselves and put him on his level as any kind of equal. It doesn't make any sense, and yet we do it all the time because we are, way, we are weak and we are frail. There's two stories when you get to the scriptures that, that are interesting in Jesus' life, two encounters that he had that I want to just compare real quick here at the end of my message. And the band, you guys can come out. In, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus encounters what, who we know is to be the rich young ruler. We don't have his name. In fact, history has long forgotten his name. But it says, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But at these words, the man was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. You know, as you reflect on the rich young ruler, he had so much going for him. He's asking the right question. He's coming to Jesus, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He had the right question. He's asking the right person. And, and as we find out, he was, I think he's being honest, he was a good person. He was a righteous person, a hard worker. He was faithful. And yet he fails so spectacularly. Because Jesus says, one thing you lack Go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. It says that, that he went away sad because he had much. You know, what a crazy proposition. You think about the proposition that God is offering him. He's saying, come and follow me. Come and be my disciple. You, you know, the, the one who created all those good things that you have, all that money you have, all the wealth, the one who created it, you it is such a pittance compared to what God is offering him. It's such a small, sad amount of wealth that the man has compared to what it is that Jesus is offering him. Jesus can offer him untold riches, palaces on palaces on palaces. Yet this man is so concerned with his little, his little bit that he can't see the treasure that's in front of him. Jesus described the kingdom of heaven like a man who goes and finds a treasure hidden in a field. And for the joy that he finds a treasure, he goes and sells everything he has to buy the field. That's what God is like. He's like the treasure of inestimable worth, of incredible value. The question is, do you see it? There's another man. We have his name, Zacchaeus. And in many ways, he's similar to the rich young ruler. He's also wealthy. He's also curious. He also wants to know more about Jesus. We find that story in Luke 19. He entered Jericho, was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He's a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Jesus, Zacchaeus had heard. At this point, it's the end of Jesus' ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And he stops in Jericho. Many people believe he stops in Jericho for Zacchaeus. He's walking through the town and Zacchaeus is trying to see him because he wants to know who this man is. But the Bible, the Bible says that he's a chief tax collector. And so what you know is you know that nobody in that crowd is making any space for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a wicked sinner. In fact, it's the dominant part of his personality is that he has joined himself to the Romans. He has stolen and defrauded people. He's an enemy of the people of God. So nobody wants to make way for Zacchaeus at all. And so Zacchaeus easily could have gone home. He could have just went about his business. But it says that he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. For Jesus was about to pass through that way. It's embarrassing. You know, but Zacchaeus, there's something. There's some curiosity. There's some driving force. He wants to know more about this man he has a divine appointment with Zacchaeus that day. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, 
hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received Jesus gladly. When they saw it, all the people began to grumble, saying, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. They begin to, to not only do they hate Zacchaeus, but they begin to, to derive Jesus. Why would this man be friends with sinners? If he was really a holy man, why would he spend any time with Zacchaeus? But look at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stopped, and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. This is just, he just got out of the tree. They, they haven't even gotten down to brass tacks yet. Is it, Jesus hasn't been like, Hey, Zacchaeus, we got some things to talk about. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to stay at your house. It says that Zacchaeus received him gladly. And then it says, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give it back four times as much. I want you to realize that's all, that's all of it. That's all he's got. A lot of his wealth he got by defrauding people. He says, I'll pay them back four times as much. And whatever's, re- whatever's left, I'll give it to the poor. Zacchaeus understood the treasure that he had. I don't think Zacchaeus was thinking about the universe or the stars or, or you know, little microbes and wondering at God. I think he just recognized there's a treasure here. This is my moment. Many of us have had those moments where we just had a recognition that, that God is here and that he wants us. And he, and he gives us that same, that same proposition he gave to the rich young ruler. Come and follow me. Give up all you have and come and follow me. And to the people who see, it is not even a question. Zacchaeus couldn't care less about his money and his fortune and all that he had, he had done and earned. The question is, what does, he, what does he have to do to follow Jesus? And he gives it all up. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. You know, when we understand God and we see him in his awe and wonder, in his splendor, in his might, in his strength, everything else fades away. Everything else becomes secondary. Because that is the God who's able to satisfy your soul. That is the God who's able to give you everything you could ever possibly want. To meet every possible need. He's your creator. He knows you. Would you stand to your feet? We need to ask God to give us a bigger picture of who he is. Because so many of us struggle. And the reason we struggle, we struggle to surrender to God, we struggle to to follow him, we struggle to walk by faith. And the reason is because we don't understand who God really is. We We have compromised him in some way in our mind to diminish him, to make him smaller. And to be fair, he is unfathomably beautiful and big and strong. So in in one sense, it's understandable, but the reality is God has to give us a revelation of his greatness because he's the one who holds all the power. He's the one who holds all the strength. He's the one who who can take care of every need that we have. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna ask God right now. I'm gonna ask him for us, and if you wanna stick out your hands like this, we're gonna say, God, would you give us a revelation, Lord, of your nature, God, of your character, would you expand our minds and our hearts, Lord, to have a, a greater, a more accurate conception of who you are? Father, come. Reveal yourself to us, Lord.